Episode 23. Go ahead. Take it away. So we've had some athletes that are playing basketball right now that also play baseball that will never take blame for anything. Mm -hmm. And it's bothersome because it's it's a trait where you get older and you get in a workplace and it, they'll blame fellow workers or their boss for things that go wrong rather than being responsible for their own actions or just even when even when somebody else says makes a mistake, you say, "Hey, my fault." You know, if I made a like a, a, a semi bad pass in basketball, and the guy like fumbled out of bounds, it's my fault. I should have I should have given you on my ins inside hand or on the outside hand. So accepting blame and being responsible for it and taking the pressure off your teammates, it, it's a good thing. However, you have enablers, which are usually the parents, their kids never do anything wrong. Blame it on somebody else. Blame it on, we had kids last year on our baseball team that kids, the kids never did anything wrong. And it's really not a, a great example for other people to see where kids are yelling at other kids or they did something wrong and try to blame it on somebody else. Blame it on a coach, blame it on a field. Blame it on the court, blame it on lighting, everything but just saying, hey, I missed a shot, I struck out, I threw a ball because I was, you know, I, you know, I was lousy. Just, it's part of being a, an adult. And I think that's something that coaches have to nip in the bud right away if they see kids that are blaming everybody else. It's got to stop immediately. And this lady who has been following us for years, Janice Meredith, she has a, a website, uh, JBM thinks.com she's uh, basically um, a guru for sport parenting you know a counselor basically and she puts a lot of great articles on it she follows us a lot and, but uh, that, that would be a go-to person because she's a parent and she's trying to direct parents to help their kids in the right way and one of them is stop blaming other people take the responsibility of your actions and what you do and take the pressure off your team and be a leader by saying hey look it was my fault let's let's move on and uh, let's learn from it and in the heat of the game you know just be a leader yeah i think i think the most important thing to gain from learning to take blame is just how you need to focus on what is going on with your level of play with your mistakes with your like where you can improve right versus all right you missed a ground ball how in in what sense is it not your fault right right, right. you could say the field sucks but if you have you know proper mechanics you probably keep the ball in front of you right. maybe it maybe it hits your chest and you keep it in front of you you can stay balanced gather your feet and feel the cleanly make a good throw However, you bail out, the ball goes going in the outfield, right? So I think the same thing with the, um, what we hear a lot in baseball is, you know, the sun is in my eyes. Right. Well, I mean, there's not really any mystery to what's going on when you play baseball. The sun, you play during the day, the sun's going to be out. Yeah. It's, a, it's another player. It's a third player on the field. So to say that the sun was in your eyes, that doesn't make anything an excuse. You know, you should be, I, I would take balls in the sun on purpose or learn how to angle my body away from the sun, right. throw my glove up in front of the sun. You know, there's different things you could do to battle. Rather know, than blame. Exactly. Yeah. Not, oh, well, the sun was in my eyes. Coach is going to excuse me, right? It's just learning, okay, the sun was in my eyes, but it's still my fault. How can I accept what, what I can control and actually move forward with it? Because if you just say your sun's in your eyes and you take that, then when do you actually get better? Because some, the sun is in MLB players' eyes yeah. all the time, right? And um, you see balls drop, but it's it's rare. It's rare, yeah. It's, a lot of it's immaturity, you know. It's like, a, and they get brainwashed by their people that outside the programs they 
are told that they're better than their teammates, so therefore they have this inflated sense of, uh, you know, betterment than than their teammates, rather than think thinking as a teammate. And that's immaturity. Yeah, and, and it's tough too. And that's and that's bad. Yeah. That's bad. Let's. That's bad counseling by the parent. When they come from all different areas, right, you know, and right. you know, every time you go to that next level, you're always like that big fish in a small pond, and then you move up a little bit, and now you're a smaller fish in a big pond, right? right? And so you come from that, you know, that family, that one sense, and everyone was praising you, or that one group of friends, and everyone was praising you. Now you move up, and so you don't know how to deal with when you're wrong or when you're not the best and so you just want to you know transfer of blame tob true so. very true i mean you you you've reached a plateau where people are as good as you and that's just excuses and that's just you know instead of hey you know these guys are as good as me i'm gonna have to work harder i'm gonna have to listen i'm gonna have to learn how to shield my eyes from you know, and take different angles for fly balls because I've been dropping some where the balls have been dropping. You know, instead of that, I said, well, you know, it's the sun, it's the field, the, the field's uneven, you know. And meanwhile, the guys who are as good as that, them or better are making catches easy, like you're saying. Mm -hmm. so. Exactly. And, I mean, you said it right there because that's how you get better. You, you accept the blame when it's, like, it's your fault that you're accepting blame. You know I mean? Right. Nobody likes a guy where... You know, some other dudes making near like, no, it was my fault. I, I was on the bench. It was my fault. Like, saying, being realistic with yourself. Like, if if it, if it, something was on you, take responsibility, take ownership, and then you move forward from there because you don't want to be in that situation again where you're letting the team right, down or right. you're letting your in the history of, in the history of sports. There's not one athlete ever that's not made a mistake. So. That's not enough said. So take the blame or learn from your mistake and move on. And mm -hmm. do what's best for your teammate. Do what's best for your betterment as an athlete and get better, basically. So, okay, let's move on. I've been hearing a lot of term, a lot of this term launch angle as hitters. It's been around forever basically ever since baseball started and now it's like because there's new you know analytics now it's a big thing a launch Data angle and all that. right and and miles per hour getting out of the ballpark and uh the height of the ball and all that stuff it's not new number one and number two why are you telling youth athletes about launch angles they should just worry about having both eyes on the ball and making solid contact. Meanwhile, we have these 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 guys that watch TV and you know did no research on it. They said, "Oh, we have to add launch angle. We have to have this you know severe uppercut or a, a pronounced uppercut." No, man, just like worry about keeping both eyes on the ball, not just your dominant eye and. Learn how to use your hands as fast as you can to the ball. Bat speed, you know, uh, proper lower body mechanics. Forget about launch angle. As a matter of fact, I'm going to put my our partner under the bus because Andy Pohl sent me a tape from Ohio. We have a franchise now in Ohio, DNA Cleveland, and he says, what about this kid swing? And he's nine years old, ten years old. He's talking about launch angles. Mm -hmm. Forget about launching. Oh, he's got a great swing, you know, but he's got this and this. He's, you know, just worry about making hard contact. Mm -hmm. everything, everything, everything will take care of itself. That's the thing, too, with uh, young athletes. I mean, people, you try to, you want them to have good mechanics, but it, it only goes so far. And I say this all the time because a lot of mechanics are supported by strength, right? If you put a kid, let's say a kid does have a good launch angle. Where else is he lacking to to have that, right? Exactly. Let's say he has a good launch angle. Maybe it's taking more strength to actually get to on that plane, right. and he's sacrificing some other flaw, or he gets it takes longer for him to get there, so he can't catch up to a fastball. You know, 
put up put a swing of a 10 year old up next to a fully grown MLB baseball player and of course he has a perfect long jingle he's more experienced he's way stronger he has more reps everything that goes into having the launch angle and all of the good mechanics versus this kid who needs there's probably more basics that he needs he needs to get stronger he needs to have fun um i mean you know there's a ton of things that goes on with a 10 year old in their life it's not just baseball and that's what i mean we people revolve their lives way too much around one one aspect right and rather than talk about launch angle i i saw this great um uh website hosted by ex MLB players and they had a really good point rather than launch angle stay connected with your swing mm -hmm. okay so they they preach keeping your back elbow in and be connected with the spine so you get that one so you know you naturally will create a lot of bat speed and you'll stay connected you go outside with your elbow, you don't stay connected. You end up hitting a lot of rollers. You, yeah. you go over top of the ball. That makes more sense than launch angle. Just stay connected. And okay? just, yeah, like be aware of your body. And that's that's yes. the best thing, too. When you're Be in, aware of your body. When, when, exactly. you're, when you're in the cage, you know, taking some batting practice or hitting off the tee, the best thing you can do is, like, feel before your swing and after your swing what's going on with your hands are are your hands out here from the start and then you're rolling over the ball well maybe that's because they're too far from you right you know, like you're right. like you're saying right. they're disconnected like this disconnected okay. right and every 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 skill activity in any sport starts from the ground up okay so rather than worry about this and you know stay connected starting from the ground up it's just really simple stuff and what we talked about off camera uh, sometimes simple is better. Mm -hmm. Like I was at basketball practice yesterday, and a kid was having trouble shooting free throws. And rather than getting all this technical, like, you know, you keep your elbow underneath the ball or, you know, your spin rate, whatever, you know, like you want to get in and like I said, spread your hand a little so your palm isn't on the ball. Yeah. Okay, so he made 19 on the next 20 free throws just by a simple thing. And another guard was shooting, and he said, you know, I've been way off right, I said, and so let me see your shot. And he was just going open hand. I said, just just finish finish your follow through. He made five in a row and left the gym. So sometimes you don't have to be technical. Mm -hmm. Sometimes common stuff, you know, like you call it street talk or whatever, or just playground talk. You know, sometimes that's good because kids understand it. Sometimes kids don't understand. Well, like, I mean, we're not... I mean, humans in general are not robots. Right. I mean, you start to speak that language later because you're just kind of totally programmed that way. But we're naturally, we're not, I mean, we have different forms of communication. And, right. You know, spin rate isn't one of them all the time. Spin rate is not one of them. <laughs> and, you know, and, you know, we, we have these, the basketball practices, we have, you know, we, we have these complicated offenses that are not really complicated. But... Our kids can't get by the first option or, or, or one simple set. So complicated terminology is not going to work with them. You have to know who you're dealing with. Maybe, in the, you know, for sure in the NBA and Division One, they understand, uh, you know, flex cuts and, you know, and down screens and, you know, whatever. But, uh, you know, pinch potes uh, terms. But these guys don't. Just simplify it. And all coaches should simplify it depending on the age group and the level of skill, mm -hmm. period. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree because I feel like the main goal is to make sure that the challenges are meeting their skills. You're creating a good environment, and they have ability to work together and produce results, positive results. Yes, yes. And like, if something's too complicated for a team as a whole, yeah, find a different way to teach it. Yeah, I mean, you have to have many different options of teaching. It just can't be one. I said, well, if I, if I go out of this area of, of expertise, I don't have plan B. Mm -hmm. I don't have plan C. Yeah. You should have about 20 plans based on experience of playing, based on experience of coaching. I even learned stuff from refereeing that I applied to coaching and playing. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it reminds me a lot of, like, of those uh, – those optical illusions you see where uh, someone looks at the picture and you see like Albert Einstein or something like that and someone else looks at it and they see a completely different shape or a different character and and that just goes to show that people see things they perceive things they learn things different ways right right you know 
versus you can't just say, you know, X plus X is this and everyone's supposed to get it. Right. You know? Right. I, I, I totally agree. And, you know, we, we, we coach two different programs. There's two different, two different types of kids. I, I couldn't coach the same way if I coached your team mm -hmm. and you couldn't coach the same way if you coached my team. Mm -hmm. So there's many different ways to succeed. So, yeah, I mean, that's just true. And you hammer that home all the time when you talk about, you know, being adaptable and adjusting to the individual versus, you know, yeah, the system breaking down. Right, right. So with that, with the um, indictment of, of coaches, which we talk about where there's only like, they can only teach like a system or there's one way of teaching how to hit, how to pitch, how to shoot. We have all these foreign players in the NBA that are starting on NBA teams. And why is that? Why are, why do the amount of foreigners increase while the American players who have a better, bigger reputation coming into the league end up sitting on a bench, have a, a shorter career? Why is that? I don't know. I mean... <laughs> I mean, I mean, for example, the 76ers, the, way... the 76ers have Joel Embiid. I think he's from, he's from Nigeria, and he played a year at Kansas. They have Ben Simmons, who's from Australia. They have this kid, Saric, who was from, you know, um, I, I don't want to, like, maybe Serbia or Yugoslavia, whatever, one of them, Croatia. And that's a good up-and-coming team. And... The Bulls for the Bulls have uh, a kid from Finland and a guy from Spain, and they're all they're all over the league, and they come in ready to play. And meanwhile, you have these American players that grow up watching ESPN and play on AAU teams. They're so poor fundamentally. Yeah, I was just about to say that. I mean, I bet the difference is fundamentals. Yeah, and I mean because they're watching. The difference is they're probably watching and studying the right shit. I mean, yeah, yeah. the little things that matter, and that's the same thing that happens in baseball because, well, we talk about the launch angle. Does that shit really, I mean, no. it matters at a certain point. At a certain get, level. At a certain level. Mm -hmm. But does that shit really matter when, no. when you don't understand, you know, certain game situations or no. what you should have done? You know, Michael Jordan was really a great fundamental player. But he came from a fundamental program, number one. But number two, he got cut. He was at a JV, and he didn't make the varsity, I think, his sophomore year uh, in high school. And so he made sure that he was fundamentally sound. And then his physical skills obviously caught up with the fundamentals. So the combination of those two was a perfect storm for him because, you know, he's the greatest player in history by far. Yeah. And um, he had physical skills, plus he was one of the smartest players, most competitive player, but he was really fundamentally sound. I mean, a great stance, um, great jump shot form. He worked at it, you know, uh, great first step, um, great rebounder really good passer when he had a pass, you know, so, and understood how to run offenses and defenses. So it's really, a lot of it's coaching. They just let these, these young American players that play AU, they just let them play without teaching them. Yeah. It's all over the country. And then they, they go to division one schools and then, and they still, maybe some of them get away with gifts. They get the NBA and only the strong survive there. Yeah. And I, I think, uh, this is a great point, bringing that full circle, though. Because um, I agree, like, a lot of it's coaches, but at the same rate, I think someone like Michael Jordan blames somebody when he didn't get, uh, when he didn't make the team. Nope. He probably just said, all right, let me move on and let me get back. <laughs> I think that's what he did. You know what I mean? Yeah, I think that's what he did. So, yeah, bringing that full circle, I mean, there's the, there's the individual characteristics that I think that's up to you to make a choice. Nobody, look, if you're the guy... You're gonna be the guy if you just gotta keep on working at it. Yeah. And if you're yeah. not, if you're not ready, then keep on trying until you are. Okay, a couple more, couple more topics really quickly. Gino Ariema, the girls' basketball coach at the University of Connecticut, won his a thousandth game 
I think he's lost 135 times, a thousand. Is he that good a coach? Maybe. You know, or <laughs> does he have the best players? And that has this going on forever, like with Tennessee with Pat Summit and Bobby Knight with Indiana and all the stuff that's going on now with Kentucky, Duke, North Carolina. I mean, it's a combination of things, though. I I don't think it's that black and white where you say, well, is he the best coach or does he have the no, best players? I, you, you know, know he has the best have... record. Yeah. But to me, the best coaches are, 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 are coaches that have to develop players. Yeah. And then make them into a winning team. I mean, he gets he gets the best athletes because he's got their reputation. Okay, we're only going to take the top one percent of the country uh, players. That's it. Mm-hmm. Okay, and he's got them. He molds them into champions because they're easy to mold. I mean, they're yeah. you know they were high school All Americans. Uh, same with Duke. Duke's got four freshmen starting. That's and, what I'm saying. Like having that reputation. Right. And. Some schools are set in stone with having that representation, but you got to think like that. That reputation wasn't always there, right? You know, so it. it well, with Duke, it wasn't when he mm-hmm. got there. You know, exactly. he almost got fired. You know, because he had a couple, two or three losing records, and all of a sudden he just took off because he got players, he had a good system, and then he just evolved. You know, exactly. And now you're getting the, the best. Now he doesn't. Now he said, okay. Um, we're really good, and we're gonna. You're not good enough, but yeah, I'm sure he does it in a political way. But uh, you know, I, I think that's where Northwestern is right now, where Duke used to be back 30 years ago. Now they have a really great coach in Chris Collins, and they had their first bit of success last year in their in their history, and they got four great players coming in, and they're gonna ride it out with these four, three or four seniors that are on the team now. And I think it's going to carry him. It's going to be like Duke Central, I think. I hope anyway, because mm-hmm. they're Chris Collins is a really good coach, and um, I think he does it the right way. Yeah. Yeah. Lastly, did you see the article today about um, the Chicago Alliance, where the five pro teams are are partnering with the University of Chicago Crime Lab to try to curb violence in the city? I didn't see that. Well, that article came out that, today. Yeah, that's uh, late yesterday, and it was on the radio today. And she, the woman who in charge of the U- University of Chicago Crime Lab, Julia Quinn, was on the score, uh, six seventy in Chicago, and uh, it's about time mm-hmm. um, because it's a cesspool there. It, it's it's getting worse. It's like there's so much gun violence that, and there's just violence and. In, in particular, and it, it's usually f- the kid. The people that usually get hurt are the kids. Yeah. Yeah. It, it doesn't matter what color. Are you always hear. A, it doesn't matter what color. You always they are. hear of a younger kid caught in, yeah. in the middle of it I somehow. Mean, yeah, kids as young as what three years old get shot. You know, mm-hmm. so it, it's a good start. If, if a lot of businesses and these pro teams, the most influential uh, organizations in the city, to get money. Uh, to do things like that are uh, the pro sports team. Yeah, so, and that's a step in the right direction for sure. You know, you, you'd like to be able to walk to a park and not worry about gunshots. Mm-hmm. And you'd like to see kids have something to do other than join gangs, and maybe this will help. You know, it's a, it's a good start. Oh, it's yeah. a good idea. But it's called the Chicago Alliance, and hopefully it works out. Last question I have for you. Okay. Okay. Um, what do you think is, where do you think football is headed, like American football? Because we talk about basketball and, and baseball, like with foreigners being in professional sports. I don't know if that would ever happen in American football with the popularity in other countries. Like, what do you think about any of that? Well, first of all, back before I was born, they had boxing in high school. Mm-hmm. And boxing is now banned in high school. I think that's where American football is going. Yeah. I think they're gonna because of the like the, the head injuries, the head injuries, and, and trauma to yeah. the body in general. Yeah, I mean, there's just so many. There's there's par- paral there's paralyzed kids. There's there's teams with insufficient uh, equipment. I know when I I was there's uh, a lot of teams like that. Yeah. yeah, they just they shouldn't be out there because their equipment's substandard. So it's Isn't either it crazy that it's been it's it's came this far already. Right. 
I'm just right. surprised. Like, going right. I mean, it's going to be, you're, you're going to have a situation where it's going to be club football mm -hmm. and you're going to, you know, parents just don't want to see their kids with scrambled brains. Yeah. Look at the, look at, and I think, you know, you're, we're watching football right now and it's week six, 15, I think, coming up. And you've got a bunch of second and third and fourth stringers playing. Yeah, they're dropping like flies. And you know why? It's mm -hmm. because these guys are abnormally big. And I think they're abnormally big because of PEDs. Mm -hmm. And, and even and they don't even bother to regulate them. These guys are take they're taking them in college. They're they're really they're and, and when you have that big a player who's as fast as a two hundred and forty pound kid back in the day, now they're two eighty to three twenty, and they're they're getting at limbs and they're hitting you in the head. What what do you think's gonna yeah. happen? I mean, and just regardless of their size, they're the game is they're flying at each other full speed. Right. Well, they had that. Each other they had that. Right? They they had that back in the forties, but they had leather helmets. Mm -hmm. and there's also there's probably a number of uh, head injuries around that time we people didn't know about or that, recognize. You're right. That's absolutely correct. Yeah, yeah I mean, you're right. But still, when you have a leather helmet, I don't think you're going to use a helmet as a mm -hmm. as an offensive as a defensive weapon to tackle because you you know a knee to a leather helmet. I, I imagine it doesn't feel very good. No way. But I, I, the prognosis for American football, unless they change it, unless they get good leadership, starting at the top, you know, and from what I've seen from Roger Goodell, I think that's his name, uh, it's not good. Mm -hmm. No, it's just like, you know, I wanted to talk about another subject, but it'll be that when you have a certain attitude from the top, it always filters down. Yeah. And if the attitude is negative, you'll get negative results. So that's it. Uh, we want to wish everybody happy holidays. Um, all of our uh, Jewish listeners, I hope you guys had a happy Hanukkah and we're coming up to uh, Christmas. Everybody, Merry Christmas. And we will be around for a long time, hopefully. And um, if we don't get back to you for uh, New Year's, have a happy New Year, and we will see you in 2018 unless we sneak number 24 in. So, speaking for Joe I think we and Mike, in before the New Year, I think we may we should. Uh, this is Dave signing off and saying Happy Holidays. See you, everybody.